In this video, I want to talk with you about what you've been taught in counterfeit Christianity regarding the end times versus what the word actually says. You've been taught to look for a temple. You've been taught to look for a temple in uh, Israel, in Jerusalem. You've been taught that Jews are going to return to Israel. You've been taught that the mark of the beast is some sort of chip or artificial intelligence. You've been taught that the Antichrist is a man, not a beast system, not a kingdom, which is what the word says. And you've been taught that that Antichrist is going to set up some sort of a socialist or communist government. You've been taught not to worry because God's wrath is not for you, even though the word says that God brings wrath on his people. And what the word is talking about when it says God's wrath is not for his people is God's great wrath, the bowls of wrath that are going to be poured out after the, re the resurrection. Otherwise, explain the rest of scripture to me. Help me understand why in the rest of scripture does God say, talk about bringing his wrath and punishment and curses on his people. He goes into great length, great detail for pages and pages about what it is he's going to do. And then he says, and then I will relent. And then I'll remember my covenant with you. Explain that one for me. You've been taught that the abomination is a statue. If you've even been taught about the abomination of desolation, you've not been taught about counterfeit Christianity. You've been taught about Babylon the great, but you've, they've never acknowledged the prostitutes that bore out of her. That's because they don't realize that they are the prostitutes that bore out of her. You've been taught that government and pagans are the ones who are going to attack you, which is being perpetuated now in counterfeit Christianity. But the word says that those who are going to persecute and kill you are those who think they're doing a service to God. And when Christ came here, he wasn't rebuking pagan, pagans. He was rebuking those who claimed to see. You've been taught, if at all, had been taught about the witnesses, what you've been taught is that there are two men who are some sort of celibates with fire coming out of their mouths dressed in sackcloth and ashes. And you've been taught that that's literal. In fact, in Hollywood movies, you're even shown that that's literal. And yet the word says that the, what, the wicked are going to continue to be wicked. They will not understand what's going on, but the wise will know. Well, I don't know about you, but if I saw two men in sackcloth and ashes with fire coming out of their mouths, a temple being built in Jerusalem, Jews returning to Israel, a chip that is being that I'm being forced to receive, a man setting up socialism or communism as a government and suddenly setting himself up in this temple that's built in Jerusalem. And I'm being told to bow down to a statue. The jig would be up. And that's why so many of you don't feel it necessary to listen and heed the words that I'm speaking to you because you think you're so slick. You think, oh, well, I'm going to recognize all these things. I'm not that dumb. Actually, you are that dumb, if that's what you think. You have not returned to God, and yet you think that you're going to be one of the wise ones, one of the ones who's going to be able to see this with your carnality. What does God value? Jesus was here, and there were people who could not see him. They couldn't see him, not with their carnality, but they couldn't see him with spiritual eyes because they had been hardened, and though seeing, they did not see, though hearing, they did not hear, because God's heart is that he's not going to allow you to just turn to him at the last minute and be saved. How do I know that? Because the scripture reads, otherwise they would turn to me and I would heal them. Otherwise they would turn to me and be saved. Let me tell you the reality. Let me tell you what scripture actually says. Scripture says that a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers are going to worship God in the spirit and in truth from the perspective of Christ when talking with the Samaritan woman at the well. The scriptures say that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So Christ became that temple. Why? Because the temple is defined not by a building structure because God doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands, but the temple is defined by where God chooses to dwell. And so a time was coming and had now come, had now come because Jesus was that temple and because those who believed in him were later to receive the Holy Spirit once Jesus had been glorified. That's the temple. And God is building his temple with Jesus as the cornerstone, the apostles and prophets as the foundation, the witnesses as the plumb line and the capstone that locks everything into place and each of you as living stones. And so if God describes each of these stones as having some sort of a purpose, the cornerstone being that stone to which everything is set in reference, the foundation being those who were establishing truth and the commands of God the foundation on which faith is built, the witnesses using righteousness as the plumb line, as the standard by which that building is being kept upright, the, co the capstone by which they are locking all of the pieces, 
into place, all of the stones into place, then you as living stones have a purpose and you need to figure out what that purpose is. And the only way for you to figure it out is through him. There is no physical temple that is going to be God's temple. Whether there's a physical temple that'll be built in Jerusalem or not, it's not God's temple because the New Testament has very clearly defined what that temple is and has very clearly indicated that God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. He has chosen certain people as his temple and those people are defined as those worshipers who worship God in the truth and in the spirit. That's the temple. Jews returning to Israel is describing God pulling us out of the nations. You're a spiritual Jew if you're engrafted in the commonwealth of Israel. A Jew is not one who is one outwardly, but is one inwardly through circumcision of the heart. You're a spiritual Jew if you have been circumcised in heart by the Holy Spirit of God. Israel is his people, not the land of Israel. Israel is his people. And so he's pulling people out of the nations and he's bringing them to Israel. When we come together in assembly... God is both building his temple and bringing his people to Israel. And those of you who don't come to assembly, you're not one of the ones. You can't be. If you don't recognize your responsibility as a living stone in this temple, if you don't recognize your responsibility as a priest in this kingdom, as a member of this church, a member of this body who needs to be functioning, you're not one of the ones. At least right now, you're not bearing that fruit. So I discern you're not one of the ones. The mark of the beast is not a chip. It is not AI. It is not something that is going to defile you from the outside because Jesus very clearly said that nothing defiles you from the outside, nothing going into your mouth. It goes through the stomach and it comes out. What defiles you is what is coming from your heart, what is coming out of your mouth, and what comes from the heart comes through the right hand, your deeds, your forehead, your thoughts, your mouth, what you declare. Paul very clearly told us that you will be justified by what is in your heart, not by some chip. That is the mark. That is the seal. You have to make the decision to which spirit you will be conformed, whether you're going to receive the mark of the beast, which will come out of your deeds, your thoughts, and your declarations, or you will receive the seal of God, which is his Holy Spirit. So the seal is what is occupying you. That spirit that is occupying you is going to live through you, just as Christ lives through those who are his. He performs his strange task through those who are conformed to his spirit, who choose him. The mark of the beast or the seal of God is defined by the spirit that occupies you. What is in your heart? What is occupying you? That is the place that you're going to be justified The Antichrist is not a man. The Antichrist is very clearly demonstrated in scripture to be a kingdom. Between Daniel 7 and Revelation 17 and Daniel 2 and Daniel 11, it is very clear, crystal clear, that the Antichrist is papal Rome. That is the kingdom that is is the Antichrist. It is the harlot riding the beast. It is Babylon the Great. And Babylon the Great has prostitute daughters. She is the mother of all prostitutes. She has prostitute daughters. They are 10 toes in Daniel 2, and they are the 10 main denominations that bore out of counterfeit Christianity, the harlot Catholic church. They are the, they bore out of the Protestant reformation. Those are the prostitutes. Yes, there are many more today, and they are all the prostitutes that bore out of her. That system is the antichrist, counterfeit religion. That also includes counterfeit Judaism, which also bore out of counterfeit Christianity. Now, let me explain that to you. Judaism, the original Judaism, true Judaism, what it truly meant to be a Jew in the Bible, not a race, but those who followed God's word, those who believed in him became Christians. That's the fulfillment of Judaism. What people call Judaism today, particularly Reformed Judaism, has been largely influenced by Catholicism, because Catholicism was through papal Rome. Remember, it's a harlot riding a beast. It's not just a religion. It's not just a church. It is a government. That is the reason why the Pope has a permanent place, a permanent seat with the United Nations. Global power and influence, it is a government. It is a woman, a church that is riding a beast, that is riding government. And that woman, that counterfeit 
religion, that, that harlot, has been affecting both Christianity and Judaism. They share the same false doctrines and prostitution to the world. I've spoken about this in other videos. I'm not going to get into it in this particular video. Now, Jesus said something when he was here to the apostles. He said, those who claim to be doing a service to God are going to be the very ones who kill you. It is the same spirit behind those who killed the prophets and the apostles and Jesus that is also going to kill you. It's the same pattern. These will be the same people who kill you if you are in Christ. They will claim to be doing a service to God. You have been taught that everyone is going up in the resurrection. Interesting. Everyone, huh? Well, let's read Revelation 20. Verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. Is John seeing anyone else or just those who've been beheaded, those who've been martyred? They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Anyone else going up? Yeah, I didn't think so. No one else is going up. Only those who've been martyred for Christ are going to reign with him for a thousand years and be priests of God. No one who's been pre-tribulation raptured. I don't see that anywhere. These people have been killed. So how were they pre-trib raptured if they've been killed? If you were ever taught about the abomination of desolation, what you were probably taught is that the abomination of desolation was going to be some statue and it was going to be set up in that physical temple that is going to be built in Jerusalem. All of that is a lie. You're not going to be able to see these things with your carnality. Uh, Gabriel told Daniel that the wicked were going to continue to be wicked. They would not understand. Only the wise would understand. The abomination of desolation is, is explained to us in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house and, and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the sovereign Lord came on me there. I looked and I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire. And there, from there up, his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and in visions of God, he took me to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the idol that prov provokes to jealousy stood. So the abomination of desolation used interchange interchangeably with the idol that provokes to jealousy. They're both the same thing. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked and in the entrance of the north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. Okay, so God is going to take Ezekiel through the temple and at the very end, he's going to show Ezekiel what the idol that provokes to jealousy is, what the abomination of desolation is. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they're doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see things that are even more detestable. And he continues to say this and he keeps showing him different things. And he continues to say, you're going to see things that are even more detestable. So, you know, from the very beginning of that, of that passage of scripture, of that chapter, that Ezekiel is going to see this idol that provokes to jealousy. It's not going to be a secret. So in the very end of all of this, as God is taking him through, he brings him to the entrance of the North gate of the house of the Lord and at that entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, which is exactly where he said the abomination of desolation was going to be, hello, verse 14, then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there mourning the god Tammuz. So what's there, guys? The god Tammuz. He said to me, do you see this, son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. So there's something that goes along with it. In that same place where he said the abomination of desolation was going to be. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the entrance of the temple between the portico and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. Well, let me tell you something. The God Tammuz is a sun God. That's why they're bowing down to the sun. He's also a fertility God. That's why the women are mourning him. So you should not be confused about what the abomination of desolation is. Tammuz has an image. You want to know what that image is? It's the cross. You remember in the Old Testament when God said, you're not supposed to bow down to a cross. You're not supposed to set up an image. Well, that's the image. That's the image that identifies counterfeit Christianity. 
That is the abomination being set up in the temple of God in you, in your heart, and among the members of counterfeit Christianity. If that's in your heart, that's what that hasn't come out of you. You have been bowing to that false God. And there's coming a time where some sort of thing is going to be set up. And I don't know if that's in the spiritual. I don't know if it's in the physical. Could be both. It's not like it isn't set up on every church steeple and sanctuary of counterfeit Christianity, or at least the majority of them. I know that, uh, you know, I wasn't raised with the cross in Mormonism, but that's still counterfeit. The point is, it is a symbol of counterfeit Christianity, the cross to Tammuz. So the word doesn't say that there's a statue that's going to be the abomination of desolation, does it? It could very well be that thing that's sitting in the sanctuary in that counterfeit church that you go to on counterfeit Sabbath, Sunday Sabbath, to go along with your sun god. You've not been taught about counterfeit Christianity. You've been taught that those who are going to persecute you are of the world. And that's why you are looking to the left and saying, ah, they're, they're the reason, they're the reason, they're the ones who are going to persecute us. Well, guess what? God is using that in order to swing counterfeit Christianity into power and make people actually stand up for something. But you know what? The thing they're standing up for is false anyway. Counterfeit Christians are the ones who are going to kill true Christians. And don't think that's so far off. There were even people who were who ended up being baptized and brought to Christ after they had killed Christ. Don't think for a second that you're above that. If you have not returned to God's spirit and you, he is not teaching you these things and this falsehood is not being brought out of you, there's a problem. You need to return to him. You're not going to be saved by what I received from God in my relationship with God. The witnesses. Okay, so you've been taught the witnesses are two men with fire coming out of their mouths and they're celibates. Let's look at, let's look at what is said about the two witnesses. First of all, the two witnesses are referred to as two lampstands and two olive trees. Revelation 2 and 3 tell you exactly what those lampstands are. Revelation, well, actually 1, 2, and 3. They are these churches in these respective areas. Now, you have been told that a church is, uh, you know, some sort of a building or identified in some sort of congregation or by some sort of doctrine of man, some sort of denomination. No, that's not what the word refers to as a church, okay? You notice that God says in Revelation 2 and 3, the church in Ephesus, Smyrna, etc. So the congregation or the assembly in, that's what's, what he's referring to as the church. He's not saying a church in, he's saying the church in. So the church is defined by those who worship God in the spirit and in truth. So these are bodies of believers, assemblies of believers who worship in the spirit and in truth in these respective areas. There are seven of those that are described in Revelation 2 and 3. Two of them have pleased him. Those are the two lampstands. He has said in Revelation 1 that the lampstands are the churches. He goes on to describe what they're doing. They're fulfilling their covenant, those two lampstands. They are being persecuted. They're maintaining the tr purity of God's truth. Paul described two trees, two olive trees, as a matter of fact, one that is a natural olive tree and one that is a wild olive tree. And he says that those who are engrafted into the commonwealth of Israel through faith in Jesus Christ are broken off of that wild olive tree and engrafted into the natural olive tree. So these are Jew and Gentile believers. Israel as a nation has also been described as a flourishing olive tree. These are the two lampstands and the two olive trees. They are also described in Zechariah 4 as those who are pouring out golden oil. What is golden oil? It is the Holy Spirit. Not by power, not by might, but by his spirit. That's what he's doing through his witnesses. And how is he doing it through his witnesses? Because they are submitted to him. They are conformed to him. They don't live in the flesh. And so they're not fighting against what God is doing through them. That is the only way that you can be used by God. You cannot be used any other way. Now, the two witnesses, the two lampstands were bodies of believers. They were groups of believers. They were not just two men, right? The two olive trees represent two nations, Jew and Gentile believers. So we've clearly established that they're more than two people. The number two is symbolic. I've done many videos reconciling the 144,000 as the two witnesses. If you need more information on that, feel free to search the channel. Type in witnesses, type in 144,000. You'll, you'll uh, pick up on videos. In Revelation 14, the 144,000, first of all, had already been sealed in Revelation 7. And they are, there are 144,000. This is a literal number. We know that because the very next thing that he talks about 
Well, first of all, the, the next thing he talks about is that there are 12,000 from each tribe. So he goes into great detail to break them down by number. And then the very next thing he talks about is the multitude in white robes, a number which no one could count. So this is not a symbolic number. This is a literal number. That was impossible for me to understand. I mean, it was just like beyond me when he first started revealing that to me. But I'm going to tell you something. Since I've been doing this work, that number has become very real. How many people show up to, to uh, assembly on this channel? Out of um, 658 people, at most, we have 15 people. That number is very real. All throughout the entire earth, 144,000 wit witnesses. Now let's listen to their description. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and the Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters and like lo a loud peal of thunder. The sound that I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. Okay? Let's take a look at that. These are those who did not defile themselves with women. What's a woman in the Bible? A woman is a church. And when God is talking about one woman, he talks about Zion as a woman who is pure, who's a, who is um, a beautiful woman, a good woman, a virtuous woman. Revelation 12, if you would like to look that up, that is his church. There's only one woman that is her, his church. He does not talk about many women being his bride. He has one bride. Women are counterfeit churches. And so when this says, these are those who did not defile themselves with women, what they're saying, what God is saying is they did not defile themselves with counterfeit doctrine and counterfeit churches. A woman is not a source of defilement or he wouldn't be referring to his church as a woman. This is describing adulterous prostitutes. They don't defile themselves with prostitute churches and prostitute doctrine. And then it says, for they remained virgins. For they remained virgins. So they didn't defile themselves with counterfeit doctrine and counterfeit churches. For they remained virgins. So by this, they remained virgins. What's a virgin? A virgin is a symbol of purity. And it just so happens that God talks about maintaining the purity of his truth. And that's exactly what they've done. That's exactly the description that is given by them not defiling themselves with women. So does this have to be men? Absolutely not. It can be men and women. It could also just be women. I'm not saying either one. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female in the kingdom of God. It's inconsequential. But let's listen on to the description of what they do. They, were per they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Ah, so they're not going off on their own lives, taking God in their dog carrier as though he just comes along for their day and their life. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. Got it. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are, blame they are blameless. So they speak the truth. They are justified by God. They are also those who are going to be purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. What does that mean? Well, it means that in Revelation 20, when we read about the, uh, the martyrs, that these, along with the rest of the martyrs, are offered as first fruits, that the first of that bumper crop that was brought to God as an offering. They've been purchased by Christ. They've been redeemed from the earth. They are first fruits. And that's what's going on in the first resurrection. They, all of them are first fruits. The apostles also were described as first fruits. And you see that as well in the description of the festival of weeks. How are you going to recognize the witnesses? Well, you'll recognize them by the description of what they're doing. Now, let me tell you what they're doing. They're sharing their testimony. They are the witnesses of God because in God's law, two witnesses are required in order to convict, acquit, or approve, establish a matter. The matter that's being established is told to us in Revelation 12. Two things were required in order to triumph over the devil. One, the blood of the lamb. Two, the testimony of the witnesses who did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. That is what is being provided to you right now. The witnesses who are sharing their testimony, who are telling you, this is what God tells me. This is what God did with me. God restored me so that I might serve him. This is what is also required of you. You know how many people listen? Take heed. 15. 15 out of 658. And it's taken over a year to even get to that point. I spent many, many workshops working with one single person. And I kept showing up with, for that one single person who wanted it. 15 at most. That's pitiful. That's really pathetic. 
And why is that? Well, I think that the reason why that is, is because of all of these things that you've been taught that you think, ah, we got a little more time. They haven't even laid the foundation of that temple, right? They're they're at war over there in in, uh, Jerusalem. So I got some more time. They're not going to be building a temple anytime soon. You're waiting for the Jews to go back to Israel, right? All Jews to just move to Israel because you don't understand what a Jew actually is. You don't understand that you're going to be justified by your heart. You're still looking for AI, still looking for that chip. Once that happens, you're, oh, you're going to know better than that. You're so slick. You're so smart. You keep saying to yourself, oh, I'm, I'm ready for him to pick me up. And you think that that makes you righteous, right? You think it makes you righteous, what God is going to do for you. I'm ready. He can take me anytime. Oh, how benevolent you are that you are ready to sacrifice being in this world to be picked up by God. What's your secret to your righteousness? Never mind that you need to suffer for him. Never mind that those who are martyred are the ones going up in the first resurrection. Never mind that those who are not martyred during this time in history, you are cast into one of two groups. You don't get to, you don't have the same opportunities that people who lived before us have. You will either be martyred and have the seal of God, or your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, and you will worship the beast. And the smoke of your torment will rise forever and ever. So you're in one of those two groups. How can you justify being in the group that's going up and is going to be a priest of God if you don't do the things that he's commanded? If you don't listen to the servants that he sent? If you're not listening to the witnesses who are testifying right now? The answer is you can't. You, you can justify yourself for yourself, but who are you? You can't even save yourself. Let me tell you what God's heart is. He says, make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. I have been telling you that that fourth trumpet is coming. I've been telling you that after the fifth trumpet, no one repents. And a lot of you think, well, I can do like the guy who was, who was you know, on the cross next to Jesus. I can just, you know, repent right at the last minute, and then I'll be saved. No, you can't. Actually, no, you can't. Because first of all, you see God's heart right here. Make the heart of this people's ca- people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn and be healed. He, he does not allow you to do that. The other reason I know that that is a lie is because when the fifth trumpet blows, no one repents after that. And yet God's people are here. And when the fifth trumpet blows, the Antichrist rises. So that means... No one else is brought in. And so if you're not bearing the fruit now, you will not make it. Let me say that again. If you are not bearing the fruit right now, you will not make it. You will have forsaken your salvation. You will worship the beast and the smoke of your torment will rise forever and ever. That is how serious it is right now at this point in history. You will not be saved at the last minute. And you actually have a covenant that you will be working out during the Antichrist reign. Your job during the Antichrist reign will be to be purified, made spotless, and refined. That's what you will be doing at that time. If you're not bearing the fruit now, you will not make it, period.